I too this morning want to start with a quick visioning exercise for everybody. So I'm going to invite everybody to close their eyes. And I want you to rewind to a couple of hours ago when you were very comfortably in your, uh, in your hotel bed and you were under the covers, had just had hopefully a very restful night's sleep, we're not up too late, uh, working on your health equity talk. Um, and you wake up and you wait and you wait and you wait. And you're waiting for somebody to come and help you get out of bed. Fast forward to an hour from now, you're hungry, it's time for lunch. You wait. You wait because you can't feed yourself and you can't communicate to somebody else that you're hungry and that you're ready to be fed lunch. You can open your eyes. That feeling that you might have just felt of helplessness or of restlessness or frustration over not being able to, to take care of yourself or even communicate your need to be taken care of is the lived experience of so many children with disabilities. Those children don't have the ability to advocate for themselves. They don't have the ability to feed, to walk, to take care of themselves, to get them out of bed, themselves out of bed when they wake up in the morning, or even to feed themselves when they're hungry. And not only that, for so many of the, those children, they don't have the voice necessary to ask others to do that for them. That's the lived experience of the children I work with at Patterson's Academy, and the children that became my anchoring why of the work that I'm doing. We learned a lot this year about storytelling and storytelling to connect people, and that's a lot about what I'm gonna talk about this morning. Um, but a lot of what I'm gonna talk about this morning isn't necessarily a story of me, but it's a story of individuals who can't tell their story of me. So I wanna start by telling the story of me, by telling a story about a, a young occupational therapist. And this therapist fell in love with the idea of helping people realize their potential and really maximize their abilities by looking at a group of individuals like really incredible children with disabilities. And instead of seeing them as their disability or their needs, seeing them as their strengths that have yet to be realized. And I fell in love with the idea of working hands-on with those children to help them unlock those skills and unlock that potential. And I spent the better part of 10 years gaining the credentials, the licenses, everything necessary to serve those children with disabilities and do so in a very hands-on manner. So I started. I started as an occupational therapy with that golden idea of helping children with disabilities um, change their outcomes and realize their potential. Um, and yes, I saw those milestones start to occur. I started to see those children take steps for the first time, feed themselves for the first time. Um, but for every physical barrier and every, every new milestone we helped those children accomplish, I started to realize that there was a systemic barrier underneath those as well that was even more challenging than those ch children's disabilities themselves. From funding deficits to models of care too complex to navigate to, to care provider shortages um, and just the physical ability to advocate for themselves in a system that doesn't know how to hear their voice. Um, the entire system was working against these children and it was so much more than the, what I was working on on a very physical level. It's stories like Eric, who is a 21-year-old with autism and a genetic condition, who made incredible strides in his communication goals. Um, he had a bright, exuberant personality that was just waiting to be unlocked and express that voice and that humor to, the to, to his community. Um, and as he, aged the ne he neared the age of 21 and graduation and the dreaded transition to adult services, um, he had made incredible leaps and bounds in his speech and his communication, um, but due to Medicaid limits on uh, speech therapy, uh, still didn't have the frequency of services necessary to really unlock his voice using his, his communication device. And little girls like Goose, that uh, was a 14-year-old girl with epilepsy and a severe visual impairment, um, that made incredible strides in her independent living skills, um, but due to support, support uh, and funding issues at school, never had the support necessary uh, to feed herself on her own. 
Yesterday, Pedro met, gave us a beautiful example of his Uncle Chicho and the unprecedented and disproportionate love that can be shown by and shown to individuals with disabilities and all individuals um, who have a disproportional uh, circumstance based off, um, based off their lived experience. Um, and that's the heart of health equity. Um, it's that every person deserves disproportionate love to achieve what they otherwise might not be possible and the disproportionate love necessary to help them realize their maximum potential. So that occupational therapist turned executive director um, discovered the massive systemic barriers at play that really impacted our children's abilities. Um, less about their disabilities and more about the, the vastness of the systems at play. Um, and my focus shifted from unlocking the potential of my patients to unlocking the potentials of the systems impacting them. Um, but as I discovered the enormity of these systems, um, I started to get paralyzed by the idea and the magnitude um, of what was ahead of me to really tackle this at a systems level and the capacity necessary to really have an action and a change at that level. It's no secret to anybody in this room, to any of us, um, that limitless passion does not translate to limitless capacity. Um, as much as we all did, I wish that our, our passion fueled capacity and that that had a limitless potential. Um, but that's just not our reality. And Kate so beautifully showed us yesterday and talked to us about what happens um, when you don't recognize that capacity and the limits of capacity and the burnout that is inevitable when you don't. So what do you do when a small step forward in your work also shows you the magnitude of the work still to be done? It's like one step forward and now 50,000 more to go. Um, and when you have minimal capacity to do so, how do you get started? How do you stay motivated? And how do you fuel that capacity? It's through this, uh, this, this organization and this fellowship that I found and realized that the greatest opportunity to increase your and your organization's capacity for impact isn't a productivity hack. It isn't something you read in an article. Um, it's not a capacity building grant from the Gates Foundation, um, but rather it's you and the network of allies that are around you and around each and every one of us in the work that we're doing and the conversations, the transparent and vulnerable conversations you have with one another around the work that can be done and the opportunity that you have together to really have that impact. The strategy for health equity is not a plan. It's not a list of goals on my agenda. It's not in my strategic plan or my even my personal goals for the year. Um, my, my, my strategy for health equity is the people around me and the network of allies that we can build together when we rally around those individuals who need their voice the most and helping to be their voice. So somewhere around module four or five or two, I was doing um, our, our health equity assignments and our leadership assignments for that, uh, that month. And I started looking at these beautiful distributed leadership models and this perfect snowflake that was just so ideal. And I started looking at it and the more I looked at it, the less I could see myself at the center of it at all. And the more I saw, the individuals like Eric and Goose in the center of it, and that they're the center and the leaders of the work that we're doing, and we're their voices, and we're re we are surrounding them in that distributed leadership model, but they're the ones at the center of the work. The why and the individuals we're serving are at the center of our work, and it's our job to surround them in that distributed leadership model and that network of support to be their allies and help them realize their maximum potential. The what maybe we're not at the center of our distributed leadership model at all, but our whys, our individual whys, the whys of our advocacy projects or our health equity projects, the whys of the work that we're doing, that why that anchors us in what we're doing, or for many of us, the who of why we're doing the work that we're doing is at the center of the work. And our job is to build that distributed leadership model around those individuals and the who and the why of the work that we're doing. For me, uh, the center of my distributed leadership model is Eric, um, who doesn't have the words to tell Medicaid that he needs more guaranteed therapy to unlock his voice and unlock his, vo his personality to the entire world. It's my, the center of my distributed leadership model is Goose, who doesn't have the authority or the agency or the physical ability to walk herself to legislators to tell them she's in need of more educational support to learn how to feed herself. Our work is sometimes invisible. 
Um, it's, it's surrounding the people at the center of that care model um, and the center of that work um, and uniting and creating power with them and around them so that their voice and their, their, their true potential can be realized. And we as courageous leaders work around the center of that snowflake and have the incredible opportunity to create networks around those individuals that truly need our support the most. I don't have that lived experience, um, but I do know that the individuals who do don't have the voice to bring it to the center of the conversation, and I wear that responsibility with a great honor. Um, it's our job as leaders to create that network, network of support to help set our vision in a direction of action, and then step back and let our group, that let that network of support unlock their capacity. And anchoring in those around us, building that support structure and that support network around our whys, and letting that be our capacity, rather than looking at ourselves as the only uh, driver of change. I found this year that organizing and leading is unlocking the power of the constituency and the individuals around that, net, that, uh, that network. Um, and uniting around our universal why to target systemic potential around those individuals. Um, we as courageous leaders work around the center of that snowflake um, and have an opportunity to create the network that will become our capacity and the potential of the individuals that we want to serve. We as health equity warriors um, have to have a nearly reckless belief in potential and the potential of systems, the potential of individuals and the potential of those around us and the leadership that they provide. Um, we may have a vision, but we alone don't have the answers or the action. So instead, of turn, instead um, I learned to turn to the people around me, to build bridges around me through transparent and connect, connected conversations around our shared values, um, painting a vision of our goals together, and our, goal, our, our goals together as a group and our goals individually towards that collective action. I found the value of uh, transparent and vulnerable conversation, um, eliminating my agenda from the table and coming to the table with two individuals and uniting around that common why and the people that are truly at the center of the distributed model. My Eric, my Goose, and the conversations that I can have with people where we anchor in with one another. Um, we anchor around that common why and let the agenda, the goals, and the actions uh, come to us together rather than me sitting down with a set of actions that I want to accomplish and aiming to have some, recruit somebody to sit down next to me while we do that work. We, my team and I explored what an ideal wor world looks like together for children like Eric and Goose and how we can do that work together. Um, it was visioning of an ideal world, what our, what our group uh, work looks like together towards that. Let's paint our ideal picture of our impact together, the road that we're going down together, and then our individual lanes and our, deal, our ideal impact for ourselves within that joint, in that joint vision together. We painted our work together, we painted it individually and in collaboration with one another. Um, and then we had opportunity, we, we showed the opportunities and strengths that were possible um, together towards our common goals. Um, those conversations took place in predictable spaces by creating uh, space within our power and our teams. Um, but it also happens in the places that you least expect it, like with uh, competition and opposition. Um, we had incredible wins with our legislators. Um, and when we, we thought we were having, we would be having opposite conversations with opposing thoughts, um, uniting around that, that why and anchoring with one another and the common belief that we did have that children deserve to succeed and deserve to achieve. And if you're looking at that common value together and anchoring in that common value, there is no really no opposition or competition. There's just another potential for an ally. Um, and then with our with our teams, um, eliminating those agendas that are pushed down and looking at an agenda that really works together towards that common that common why um, and the the potential that's possible for our children. Um, so once you take your, net, your network of your why and the individuals you're serving, the fun really begins of unlocking the potential for children like Eric and children like Goose. It's our job to help our network paint a picture of where we're going um, and what does great look like for them? What does wonderful look for like for those children who can't sit down at the table and meaningfully uh, participate with you or be a voice at that table? They are our capacity for change. 
we are the support that helps them be that be that change. Um, it took vulnerability with our team through uncertainty to give control over to them, trust that we were all united in our why and our values and our vision, and then give them the autonomy, the competency, and the, the direction to execute on those goals. Um, I had to give myself permission to let go and let them be the increased capacity and stop looking at myself as the, the individual that had the responsibility to change and be the direction. Um, our job is uh, to ensure that we're all related in our, in our shared why. And once, I, once they were, I stepped back and let them execute on that. So when you have your why, um, and that's at the center of the work that you do. Um, the world works around them and unlocks their potential. Um, kids like Eric receive this intensive speech therapy they need to learn to use their AAC device by themselves um, and tell their, use it for the first time at the age of 21 to tell their mother that they love them. Um, kids like Goose pick up a fork for the first time at school two weeks ago and feed themselves from start to finish. Um, from saying that they were she was hungry to picking up the fork to the last time the fork went down on the plate. She did it herself. And as I learned this year, the work never stops. Health equity is a beautiful and infinite game that we're all in together. Um, we have to have reckless belief in the potential of the people around us um, to build that capacity and the potential of the people that we're serving and what's possible for them when we do our work. Um, the people around us are our greatest assets and capacity builders. And as we work towards the beautiful goal of health equity, they're our greatest assets and allies. Um, so as we go forward this year, um, I certainly count every single person in this room as uh, my allies, that network and that network of support. I felt incredibly supported in the growth that we've done here and the network of the allies um, and the fellows in this room to be that support for one another as we anchor in our various whys around us and as we go home. Um, and I just have a few reminders, and it's that passion is not capacity. Protect your capacity and know when it's reaching its limits. Protect yourself when you have your least capacity and release responsibility of yourself to be the, to be the person uh, executing the change, but anchoring the people around you. And then if the why, always remember that the why is at the center of, the, uh, center of your work. It's not you, yourself, or your agenda. Um, and as you inevitably succeed in everything you do and you unlock five new goals for every one that you achieve, look at the people around you, including everybody in this room. Um, you're serving to unlock their limitless potential and they are your capacity. Thank you.